Welcome to the Book Editor Show. Today we're discussing writing and editing dialogue. I'm Leslie Watts, standing in for Clark Chamberlain. And in a world plagued by on the nose and rapid fire dialogue, with tags that excessively employ adverbs, one man has gone to the ends of the earth, battling Komodo dragons, Siberian tigers, and polar bears to find the true secret of writing and editing dialogue that is full of tension, conflict, and awesome sauce. That man is my friend and the book editor show co-host, Peter Turley. Peter, how are you today? <laughs> Talking about awesome sauce, the, uh, that, that intro is pretty awesome sauce. Clark's going to have a, a bit of a challenge on his hand when he uh, returns from his part-time good guy gig, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, um, it was a treat. I was looking forward to that part the most. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, yesterday you were you were pretty excited about it, so I've I've been thinking about it for at least twenty four hours. So it was worth the wait anyway. <laughs> oh, good, good. So, um, so today we're talking about um, dialogue. Uh, we're going to be talking about a few um, pitfalls um, that are quite easy to fall into when writing dialogue. Um, how you should structure dialogue. Um, including punctuation, and then a few tips um, that you can take away when you're writing and going back and editing um, your dialogue. Um, so we were discussing um, off air, weren't we, that um, one of the major pitfalls of dialogue um, can be using dialogue um, as exposition. Um, do you want to talk mm -hmm. a little bit about um, what that might mean for anyone that sort of you know doesn't really know what what that could be? Yeah, so I think it comes in, you know, different varieties, but one thing that happens is you get the, um, as you know, Bob, uh, this button transforms the whatever thing. And, you know, like, I'm not, I'm not, I should have written a fun example. But the point is that, um, is that you're the only purpose for the dialogue is to give some information. It's not, um, it's not revealing character. It's not um, doing anything else like showing an exam, um, you know, a reaction to something that's happened. It's just, oh, I need this information conveyed and I'm going to give you a bunch of stuff. Yeah, it's more for the, for the author than for the, the character. I think a good way to, to, to spot that is when, um, Kind of, kind of the example like you've just given when a character is saying want, saying something to another character that that character would already know <laughs> so right. you know, i think if, if you spot that in the dialogue then yeah because it's not always like we don't set out and be like oh i think i'm going to use this as a little shortcut <laughs> to to get something across sometimes we do it like unconsciously and we don't realize we're doing it because it's easy to do isn't it it's easy to to slip out a bit of backstory or um to, to just tell the reader something that we think they need to know and use dialogue to do that. So it's not like we're always doing it on purpose, but um, it's it's really common, isn't it? It's, this is something that happens like all over the place. I bet, like, I mean, as an editor, do, is it something you see a lot? Yeah, yeah, I see it. And and I think what happens is that, um, that people know, oh, I'm not supposed to do an info dump. You know, I'm not supposed to tell all of this and that dialogue is action essentially is showing. So, um, so I'm going to go, you know, like this is better and it is better, but you also have to be, you know, like, yeah, you have to go back through it and, um, and, uh, find that stuff and take it out. Yeah. That's a, that's a great point. Like, um, sort of thinking, you know, okay, writing 101, I'm told to avoid info dump and it's dialogue so it so it can, by default it can't be an info dump or it can't be exposition but but it can <laughs> so yeah, yeah. It, it definitely <laughs> takes a, a trained eye to to spot when that's happening <laughs> yeah yeah it's easier to spot in other people's work though i will say because um because i'm guilty of it as well <laughs> yeah definitely and i think it's especially i mean if if you can get in the habit of not doing this during the writing process, then that's great, and you're you're really well on your way. Um, but this de this definitely applies to the editing process because it is hard to to spot. Um, and obviously, we'll talk about some tips later on in how you can you can look for certain things uh, within your dialogue. 
I think uh, another major pitfall, and again, and, and this is this is something I've seen a lot and done, is using the same voice for all dialogue. Um, mm. Now I know using voice is a tricky thing, but some it, it can be easily done where all the dialogue kind of, if we took it out of the book and just had it on a page, we wouldn't necessarily be able to know which character was speaking because it, it's just this generic like dialogue way of, of writing. Um, do you ever see anything like that? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, and honestly in, in writing that, that it's really hard for me to give people, other people distinct voices or, you know, different characters, distinct voices. And I definitely see it in the um, manuscripts I edit that, you know, that you just get on a roll and you're not, um, I, I think this is how it happens that you get on a roll and that you don't, you haven't, um, you don't have, you may not have the characters distinguished in your head, you know, in terms of how they speak differently and, and that kind of thing. And so everybody, yeah, ends up using the same words, using the same phrases and, um, and sounding a lot the same. Right, right. So, so this is something that can happen mainly if you don't, you've not fully fleshed out your character or, you know, you don't know your character well enough. So perhaps, um, spending some time, you know, creating character sheets and, and really getting into the head of your character and making sure you know the motivations can help to avoid this. Because I think that uh, it's important to remember that, and it's the same for us as well as <laughs> like characters in a book. Generally when we speak, it's because we want something and there's a, there's a reason to us speaking. And I think it's important to sort of consider that, at, you know, to av avoid in this pitfall that, you know, what is it, what is personal to this character? You know, what they're going to be speaking for a different reason than the, the other person that they have or persons that they're having a conversation with. Um, so I think that's a good way to, to just get more into that mind of the, each character individually. Um, obviously, you don't want to go too overboard and be like with accents and dialects and think, you know, okay, so I want to make it clear that this one character is speaking. So I'm going to, you know, have them speak with a Southern drawl in every word that I write, which just makes the whole prose quite difficult to get through. <laughs> right. Yeah. That, um, I think that, I mean, don't get me wrong. I love accents as much as the next girl, but uh, but it can be in the text. It can be really distracting. And so I think, yeah, it's if we think of it as, you know, like the cayenne pepper in the in the dish and you only want just a little tiny bit of it when you want to show that somebody has a. Uh, a, you know, a particular dialect or a particular accent, uh, just, you know, one or two words, let that settle in the reader's mind. And then for the most part, write it normally. That's a, that's a great sort of analogy to think of it as, <laughs> as cayenne pepper. You know, you're really not going to want too much of it because they made me think though that that's kind of like when you have, you're writing a character and you're like, right, I'm going to make this character really unique and quirky. So you give them loads of like, traits you know maybe it's like a nervous tick or a way they walk or um, you know in, in 50 shades of gray i think is the characters the characters famously always biting her lip <laughs> and, it, and it's sort of like what would this person actually look like in real life if they did all of these things all of the time <laughs> you know like if they had yeah. all of these ticks and traits they'd just look like they'd be they'd, they'd become a caricature so to speak <laughs> right right and no one would yeah, everyone would just walk away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, I'm not going to interact with you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh, the speaker with an accent all the time. It's like, okay, we know that you know, we know you're Scottish, or we know we know where you're from. <laughs> right, we get it. You can lay off. <laughs> yeah, because because obviously, dialogue still got to be accessible, right? It's still got to be as easy to read um, as, as the rest of as the book or the the rest of the the work needs to be really. Um, I think our we agreed on our, our third pitfall some, is, and this is a bit general, but we'll, we'll get into sort of what we mean by this, is um, is weak dialogue. And when our dialogue's weak or, you know, we're, we're not too confident in the character or there's a particular reason why 
it's coming across weekly. And we tend to over overcompensate with um, our toolbox and we'll whip out, you know, we'll use beats too often. We'll use a variety of different tags in order to strengthen our dialogue. And, you know, this is, this is easily done because the, on first pass, it, it does strengthen the dialogue. And, it, you know, because we kind of, a tag could be used to assist the sentence. You know, it, it gives it a bit more power in sort of conveying to the reader, like what, the, what way this was said. You know, so was right. it said angrily, you know, was it said shyly or or anything like that? And I'm guessing mm -hmm. this is something that you see quite often. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that this is um this is rough draft material and it's also, you know, it's writing 1.0 because as we're, you know, as we're writing, we um, you know, like we're picturing it in our mind and we maybe don't wanna like we're trying to get through the scene. And so we're just the the adverb or the you know the elaborate um, beats you know can be the um, the bookmark for when we come back later. And the important thing is to do is to go through 2.0 and 3.0 and um, and edit those things out and make sure that the that the speech is strong um, and that you're that it's um that it reveals character that it's you know that it can stand on its own that you don't need um the uh like you don't want to draw attention to the tag and to the adverb you want to draw attention to the speech yeah i think you um you had a a, a great quote from um james scott bell saying if you think of speech as action it will keep you from writing soggy in a dialogue uh, speeches action reminds you that characters talk in fiction because they want to further their own ends and it and it is that that idea that kind of strengthens the dialogue um because you you wrote some pretty funny um things about on the nose dialogue um mm. so, so what what do you mean by um on the nose dialogue yeah so on the nose is like hey how are you doing and uh <laughs> and oh uh, yeah which are I'm things thinking, that we do actually say we do i mean that's the thing you know um the the point is of course in fiction we're trying to cut away the stuff that doesn't support the story doesn't add to the story and so two characters speaking just to speak with no um with you know with no reason with no um story reason it's boring and it's you know if we want that we can go you know talk to whomever we encounter in the world and <laughs> what we want in the in a story is we want a very well crafted experience and that means that every piece of dialogue is in there for a reason not just because we need somebody to say something yeah yeah it's it's kind of like you know you can think of dialogue almost as its own scene in the sense that when you're editing mm -hmm. the, often in first drafts we can ha we we can need to write our way into a scene just so that the scene gets out you know so that we we just that we get through it and then when we go back you know sometimes we might look at it and we might think okay how late into this scene can i actually start you know can i can i cut a load like a page or a paragraph before the real action happens and i think it's the same with dialogue and you know if we see these on the nose things like hey how are you oh i'm fine that you know maybe what's happened is you know you're just writing your way into the dialogue and you're writing your way into the action as you would have seen so think of it like that and you know look at the dialogue and think okay so where is the action happening or where is the real motivation taking place what you know and and what can i get rid of sort of around that to leave me with this really distilled dialogue that's a lot stronger uh, without these these things right yeah yeah i totally agree can get to the point and the and that that is the way you know that a lot of times that um sort of throat clearing is how we get to the heart of the scene and the heart of what these people want to say and so it's a it's a natural thing to have this and to have it in the first draft um and then it's just a process of finding it and and getting down to the 
the meat of it, so to speak. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you definitely don't want to have a standard of yourself, which is I, I never do this because we'd never get through first drafts if if we <laughs> held ourselves to that standard. This this right. You know, we I know we say it several times, but this applies to editing and you know, this is when the real magic happens and you know we look for these things and, and we get used to spotting them a little more easily each time hopefully um so let's talk a little bit about um structure now and how how we can um kind of structure dialogue differently um so we, we, we mentioned tags before um mm -hmm. and so so let's talk about what a, what a tag is which, which ones are better to use and perhaps we're exactly in the sentence they should be or where in the dialogue they should be yeah so um so the tag is the thing that identifies who's speaking so it's um generally said you know fred said um <laughs> of course you can get really you can get really elaborate and um you can say you know uh Susie growled or hissed or, you know, it's, there's a, there's a wide range of what you can do. But again, going back to what you said earlier, it's more important for the, that the tag disappear into the, you know, into the background because the, the, what you want the reader to get is the speech and what, you know, what the character is saying. So having an, a, this kind of elaborate or fancy dialogue tag um, that that it's um, it distracts the reader. So you want to, you know, use said as much as possible um, and have the um, and the tag generally goes after the um, the speech unless you've got somebody unless it's not completely clear who it who is speaking and then you might put it like after the first sentence that's um, what james scott bell recommends is that you put it you put the tag if you have a long speech you put the tag after the first sentence and then continue um the the speech so that the reader easily knows who it is but that um it doesn't come if it comes before it can be a little distracting though it's certainly fine in in certain contexts yeah, and I think also because um, structure is something that we can use as well um, to to make it more pleasurable to write and also more pleasurable to read. And I know you have a um, a quick sheet on punctuating dialogue that has some great examples of different ways that you can structure sentences. And I think it's good. It you know it is great to mix it up sometimes just to. Um, just for a little bit of freshness. I mean, obviously you don't want sort of, you know, to write every line of dialogue differently and to just right. not have a, 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 an author style or a writing style. But, mm -hmm. you know, maybe every now and then it can just sort of help keep it a little fresh to in, to include one of these things. And I think we'll include this in the in, in the show notes so people can check it out because that's a really helpful uh, worksheet that you've, you've put together there. Yeah. Um, so do we do we always need dialogue tags? So obviously we can put them at the end, we can put them after the first sentence. Can we get rid of them altogether? Yeah, I mean, when it's clear who is speaking, then you don't need to have a dialogue tag every time. It's really um, it's really a functional piece of the dialogue sentence that is, you know, you use it when it when you yeah when there would be confusion and otherwise you can cut it um which oh, you know some people might be um concerned about but i think um as long as it's clear from the context who's speaking then it's um not necessary yeah and i think that's a that's a great sort of exercise you know maybe when editing one chapter is kind of think okay you know i'm gonna be on the lookout for when i can omit tags entirely um and I'm, you know, so I'm going to take on this chapter or this scene. I'm going to look at my dialogue, and I'm going to think, is it clear who's speaking? Um, obviously, without excessively using beats or, you know, it. But from the scene, maybe there's only two people there. Um, is it clear? And you know, can I get rid of the tag? Because by getting rid of it where you can afford to, I think that means that you can be more liberal when you need to. Sort of. Mm -hmm. so 
yeah, without sort of just having dialogue tags everywhere all the time. <laughs> Which right. is why it is, I think, important to try and stick with said as often as you can, um, just because it's safer and because we use them so much, it's it, it does help not to draw attention to them in that way. I think um, yeah. we mentioned um, rapid fire dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what's that? Yeah, so rapid fire dialogue is where you have just you know. He said, she said, he said, she said, you know, like you have, it's, it's just dialogue, sentence after dialogue, sentence after dialogue, sentence, nothing is happening. Otherwise, um, you know, pe the people aren't having an internal reaction, your point of view character is not having an internal reaction, and nobody's really doing anything. And it makes it speeds the scene up. So sometimes you might want to, you know, have a moment um, you know, a small section where you do have a lot of dialogue kind of stacked up. But for the most part, you want to be weaving in bits of the setting, bits of um, action, and um, to make it a more, like, it's a tapestry, not, um, not just a list, sort of. That's not yeah. a very good. <laughs> I'm not sure that works, but uh, I, can, I can imagine it. Yeah, so it's it's you know it's weaved into the sentences amongst beats and description. You know, it's mm -hmm. not just this big thin column, you know, bordered by white space. That and you know you that can be almost as eye rolling as you know when you see a big thick page with no white space and you're like, oh, this page ain't going to be too much fun to read. Right. <laughs> just as you see like a a big list of dialogue, you're like, okay. You know, brace yourself for a, a, a just a, an utter back and forth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's almost like you, the reader, feels breathless at the end of a passage like that, as um, as if they were having to read it all out loud. So, yeah, yeah. I totally agree. I think, um, like anything, you know, because obviously we don't ever want to say never do this. Um, you know, it it has its place, and it's about figuring out when you want to use these to your advantage. And I think, you know, if you're trying to build, um, increase the pace of a scene, then this can be really effective um, to do in, in short bursts. And I think, you know, if there's a, maybe if there's an argument, you know, you might see a little bit of this. Um, so again, it's going to happen. And I think it is important to just consider, you know, what, what when do I want to use this? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you talked, um, you've mentioned a couple of times having excessive um, descriptive beats and how that can be distracting to the reader as well. Yeah. I mean, um, so, I, I mean, if we talk about what a, what a beat is, um, I, I mean, a beat is kind of where we can't, we, we sort of punctuate the dialogue with something that happens. So um, a character doing something, um, interacting with the scene around them. Um, so, I mean, and there's, there's loads of examples of this on uh, the sheet that we're going to put in the, in the show notes. Um, and, but they can be used effectively um, to add variation and like you say, to weave this tapestry of dialogue. Um, but again, this is something that can really be overused. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, do have you got any, um, any examples or can you, you know, is this something that you see sort of in, in a lot of um, writing that you edit and um, people using beats too much? Um, and like we mentioned earlier, perhaps to, to strengthen dialogue. Cause I think this is something that is, is quite hard to do well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what I will find um, it mixed in with the dialogue often is um, a lot of uh, like stage direction type descriptive beats where um the you know the person will say something and then they do like five things in order that wouldn't necessarily be like it would be better like it would be better to compress those things and to like pick like one or two actions that um that reveal character or reveal how the person is feeling or how they're reacting to what's being said and that kind of thing. And so you want to, you do want to limit that and make sure that it's, if it's, 
you know, make sure it's necessary and make sure it's supporting the scene and conveying this, what you need to convey for the story. Yeah, really well said. I think um, that quote comes to mind. I can't, I can't remember for the life of me uh, where it's from. You know, the one about the, the gun in the room. So if you put, if you put a gun in a room, um, oh, someone yeah. better use it, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that, think that Nabokov, I don't know. I can't remember. I wouldn't yeah. want to miss <laughs> Tribute. Uh, but yeah. yeah, I wouldn't want to misquote it, but um, it, it's kind of like that. And I think that applies to beats, you know, as well. And if, you know, if a character's interacting with something in the middle of dialogue and, you know, then this thing should be important, really. It should, you know, come into the scene as the scene moves along and, and not just the, you know, the walking around the room, like picking everything up and doing all these things that are irrelevant, really. Yeah, I mean, it's the it, it. I guess it's the functional equivalent of of um, the on the nose dialogue. It would be, you know, it's like on the nose descriptive beats. Yes, people do that, but is it important to the story? Probably not. A lot of it, but again, it's that you know stuff that's left over from the first draft that we're you know we put in because we're working our way through it. Yeah, so you, you know, you wouldn't want to have a character kind of the talking away, but while they're talking, they, they rub at the shoulder or something, and and you think, oh, you know, is this a, an important injury or is this something we're gonna that's gonna come? Out? But then nothing comes of it. It's just something that the character did for yeah no real reason. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so yeah, I think remembering that w when we mention those things like some little action, some little thing that, that the, um, that the reader is kind of holding that in their head as a sort of open loop. Um, and so if we give them too many things to hold like that, that aren't important, then, um, then we're sort of taxing their ability to enjoy the story. Yeah. And we're also, I think, training them to miss, um, important plot points later on. So when right. we do drop something in, they're kind of like, meh, that doesn't matter. <laughs> I'll just disregard it. I don't yeah. have a, you know, like, I don't have a plan. I don't have a, a, that's exactly what it should be. Like in the, especially in the beginning, you should be training the reader to notice what they're supposed to notice. And yeah. then that way they will pick up on those, all of those things that you want them to pick up on. And yeah. yeah. So I think, um, you know, move forward um, cautiously and use them sparsely with this, I think is is the key. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so punctuating um, dialogue, um, obviously we've talked about different structures we can use. And I mean, generally it's, it's the same rules of punctuation really, isn't it? That, that we would follow, you know, with any other line that we would write within the book. Right. Yeah. So um, the, uh, and it's not very exciting. It doesn't translate well to audio, uh, <laughs> which is why, which is why we have the punctuation sheet, the dialogue punctuation sheet to help out with this. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, um, there are, so if you, it's, it's a dialogue sentence and the dialogue sentence consists of the speech, which is in quotation marks, which is joined to the tag, which is also part of that sentence, um, you know, uh, generally with a comma, but sometimes with a question mark because um, you know if it's an act, if it's a question, um, and then the descriptive beat as well is often part of that sentence. But if all you have is the, um, if you have the speech, and then a descriptive beat, those are two separate sentences. If the, it's the dialogue tag that pulls them together and makes them one sentence. Um, so, and then of course there's variation um, with uh, the, in the UK, you all do it. Uh, you have, you use single quotes, right? Yeah. And oftentimes the, the comma, where the comma and the period goes in dialogue is more about function rather than about, um, about you know like we just as a in in the states as a matter of course we put commas and periods inside the quotation marks whereas in the uk english it's more um it's more functionally based 
and often appears outside. Yeah. And I think, you know, head over and look at that sheet for a really, you know, in in depth look at this. Um, Because obviously, you know, we don't, with punctuation, we don't want to take away, um, you know, artistic license and being able to have, you know, to break some of these rules consciously and stylistically. Um, but obviously, like any rule, you you need to know it before you you choose to break it. So I think, you know, a good thing to do is to take a book that you're reading or a book that you like and, you know, just look at the dialogue and look at how it's written, how it's punctuated. And um, that's, the, that's the best way to learn these things, really. Um, and because spell checkers and things can be a little bit of a nightmare sometimes with um, especially if you're trying to make a stylistic choice um mm-hmm. so yeah just pick up pick up a book and um and look through these things um so i think i've got a couple of tips here that you know you can take away and just to sort of help when you're, you're looking over your dialogue and you're trying to think what what am i looking for and what can i do i think one of the the great places to start firstly is to to check the strength of the dialogue by removing all tags and beats and and considering how well the dialogue stands just on its own i think that's like a great first move to think to to troubleshoot um your your dialogue yeah yeah definitely if you strip it down is it does it make sense is it important and um yeah, for sure. Um, I would also add um, that you'd want to um, take us do us definitely do one pass through your manuscript where all you're looking at is the dialogue, so that you're not so that you're focusing on it and not um, getting distracted by other things. Um, and then definitely reading it aloud. Of course, I'm a fan of reading the whole manuscript aloud, but particularly the dialogue and how does it sound to your mind's ear. It's easier to tell how it sounds to your mind's ear if you read it aloud. So I think that those, yeah, that I would definitely recommend doing both of those. Yeah, reading aloud is a powerful tool. And I think even more so is like reading aloud and recording it and then listening mm. back. You know, and you Maybe you, you don't have to do this for the whole thing, but even just a scene, you know, this can work pretty well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm writing that one down because <laughs> I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> that's, a, that's something I do with, especially with opening scenes and openings um, and to see how how powerful it is and, you know, how much it's drawing you in and how engaging it is. And I think... It's always fun to do it in a little bit of an accent and to and and to and to re, to listen to it back and you know to just see how how it sounds how you know how would this sound as an audio book you know would it is it does it sound like you think it sounds when you're writing it because sometimes there can be a disparity there and this is the only way you're really going to figure that out I think and it's fun yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it, it's funny you mentioned audio book um you know thinking about that considering that because um because recently i was editing a manuscript and i knew i knew that it was going to be eventually an audio book and um and i saw you know places where i thought oh those consonants together are going to be hard to say and so um and that made me think there are probably other things that the audio book uh narrators are you know like oh i wish they wouldn't do this and uh so i'm planning to talk to a few of them in the near future to get some tips on how to edit your book for audiobooks which is an aside but but it's just an interesting thing to think about like um as you move from writing 1.1 and or 1.0 to 2.0 and 3.0 like the more things that you consider and the um, the tighter your manuscript becomes and the better it um, it delivers your story. So, Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Um, so, yeah, I think um, that, that about wraps me up for, uh, for dialogue. Do you have anything, anything else you want to add? Um, probably. I mean, I could talk about this for a long time, but, <laughs> uh, but let me say um, one last thing. 
I'm looking at my thing. Oh, yeah. Um, one other thing is to look at the balance of dialogue and not dialogue. So there's the, you know, dialogue that is, um, ex there you have rapid fire dialogue and you have dialogue with, uh, um, with too much, um, too, too many descriptive beats, but then on the page, make sure your scenes are, um, have a good amount of dialogue in them, um, to, uh, to balance out the rest of the action and exposition. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's an important, and that's one I'd, I'd not considered really. Yeah. You know, am I, am I underusing or overusing it? So much to think about. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. But, you know, try not to be overwhelmed. Take take one thing yeah. at a time. I think, you know, right. you, we can, it's, it's it's good to go through and just pick one of these things, like, you know, like mm -hmm. anything and, and, and work on one thing at a time. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I'm so glad you mentioned that because, yeah, it can be overwhelming. Oh, I have to do this and I have to watch out for this and I have to edit this out. And then, yeah, it's just one step at a time. Improve yeah. one thing. Yeah, because that, that's just that's a good way to just miss things. I think if you if you take too too much on, and that's why we have second edits, <laughs> right? <laughs> Multiple passes. <laughs> Don't take case. just one pass at that manuscript. It's worth another. <laughs> yeah, you're worth it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if you like the show, please leave us a review on iTunes, a plus on Google, or a like on YouTube. And if you're an editor who'd like to be a guest on the show, stop by thebookeditorshow.com and drop us an email. I'm Peter Turley, and for our co-host, Leslie Watts, keep writing, keep learning, and build a better book.